Good evening, everybody. Uh, the Sedora Lectures were established in 1965 uh, in order to bring a variety of speakers to the University of New Hampshire to address critical and sometimes controversial issues in politics, society, science, and culture. In memory of humanitarian and businessman Saul O. Sador of Manchester, whose business practices reflected his ethical principles and his interest in providing security to his employees. Supported by the Sador Family Foundation, this preeminent lecture series is sponsored by the University Center for the Humanities as part of their commitment to public service, intellectual inquiry, and the Center, of, uh, the Center for Humanities hopes that these programs continue to provide venues within which intellectual communities thrive and freedom to think differently is strengthened. And so in the tradition of the Solo Sedora Lecture Series, we welcome you this evening for the first of our seven events that will be planned for this academic year. As you can see above, uh, the title for the 2019-2020 Sedora Lecture Series is What is a Criminal? Exploring Mass Incarceration in New Hampshire and in the United States. This year's series will bring together collaborators from across the university and beyond in order to ask questions such as, what is a criminal? Which people do we deem such a threat in our society that they must be removed from it? What can be done to keep people from becoming criminals? And once deemed a criminal, can a person reintegrate into society? To productively engage these questions requires multidisciplinary approaches which demand a collaboration that transcend the academy, putting researchers in conversation with practitioners and public servants who are, who are adjusting their working definitions of criminal in real time. To that end, this evening's inaugural roundtable event is simply entitled, What is a Criminal? I'll turn it over to my colleague, Alex, Holtzneen Kemper, <laughs> sorry. <Good job. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to introduce our distinguished panel for this inaugural event. Good evening, folks. Uh, I'm just going to take a minute or two to introduce our speakers, and then we will open up the discussion with Professor Gaudet. Uh, I'll start at the far end. We have Dave Kurtz, police chief of the Durham Police Department. He received his bachelor's degree in criminal justice at the University of Southern Maine. He's a graduate of the FBI National Academy 153rd session and is a national expert on needs and organization, the organization of smaller police departments. Uh, next, next up we have Blair Rowlett, Rowlett. She received her dual bachelor's from right here at UNH in psychology and justice studies. After a decorated career as a correctional officer in Stratford County, she's shifted her focus to the needs of the mentally ill in the prison system and is now a director of Stratford County Community Corrections. Got that right, right? <laughs> uh, next up, we have Professor Amy Vorenberg. She received her JD from Northeastern University and is a clinical law professor for UNH in Concord. She has great experience as a district attorney in Manhattan, an assistant attorney general in New Hampshire, and has served and served many years on the New Hampshire Adult Parole Board. Next up, we have Professor Sabrina Smith from right here at UNH. She received her PhD in philosophy from Cornell uh, and teaches courses here with an expertise in, among other things, ethics, the philosophy of science, the philosophy of biology, and the philosophy of evolutionary explanation. Lastly, we have Dr. Ted Kirkpatrick, a criminologist who earned his PhD in sociology, has worked as a juvenile case worker, as a corrections officer in a maximum security prison, and has trained officers and published widely in the field of criminology. And he now serves here at UNH as the Dean of Students. And I ask you to join me in welcoming all five panelists. Yours? I don't know, I'm going to go up over here. Oh, thank 
<laughs> thanks, Donna. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thanks to our very distinguished panelists for making time for us tonight. Um, I also want to thank the Center for the Humanities, which uh, manages the Sador Lecture Series here, uh, represented by Stephen Trascoma. Thanks for being here. And and Katie, oh sorry Katie, I didn't see you, hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, and also to Catherine Peebles, whose idea this was in the first place. So thank you for coming um, and for starting this off. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions of our panelists to get started and then we're hoping that you all will ask most of the questions um, at this event. And I know many of you were required to come with some, so that should go fine. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the first question of all of our panelists to answer in turn. Um, can you think back on your varied careers? Is there an experience you can point to that led you to think in a different way about what it means to be a criminal, what criminality is? And whoever comes up with the answer first can start. So I'll start. Uh, I, I'm starting because um, so I don't know my colleagues on the panel um, um, outside of, I think I know a little something about Ted uh, in the Dean's office, but I'm a junior faculty, um, just starting my career. I'm up for tenure this year. Um, I don't consider myself distinguished. That's the first thing. Um, <laughs> and I think it's important. Um, I think I have some things to contribute to the conversation, but I wouldn't say I'm a distinguished member of the academy. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is I actually don't work on the question of criminality or issues dealing with criminality. And you might wonder, well, why are you doing on the panel, Sabrina? <laughs> you don't have the relevant kind of expertise. Well, I tend to think of, um, um, uh, well, I think of the issue or the question of criminality as uh, an issue and a question that pertains to human beings. Um, and I'm interested in questions at the intersection of philosophy and biology, um, uh, particularly in the case of human beings. I, I, I take philosophical um, uh, arguments, a philosophical attitude, philosophical investigative methods to thinking about um, human beings as biological behavioral systems. And when I do that, I find that um, uh, I encounter arguments and uh, conclusions that very much usually are at odds with the stated, uh, the states of affairs. This is not unique to me. This is sort of what um, philosophers of biology and philosophers of science do. So the question of criminality seems appropriate for, for me to think about precisely because I think about human nature and human behavior in particular. And criminality is uh, a pertinent, potent issue when we're thinking about, say, questions like uh, eugenics. Um, the fact that uh, there was and still is uh, uh, this idea that some human beings ought not to be permitted to procreate. And so my response or my attitude to thinking about criminality is coming out of this sort of much more general framework of thinking about biological questions. And I guess as a, as a sort of um, first approximation, I would say, uh, if we're not interested in definitional issues, and I take it that we're not, then it seems to me we are interested in thinking about why is it or how is it that certain sorts of behaviors are characterized as criminal. And it seems to me that a, a, a quick answer is, well, it depends who we are, where we are, time in history, um, and the sorts of rules by which we're living our lives. When we think about those things in relation to criminality, then we sort of get these different kinds of answers. Thanks. I don't think any of us want to go after that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Blake. So I, I look back on my career, and about a year after I graduated from UNH, I found myself in a correctional setting, which was just bizarre in and of itself. Um, my first experience was really thinking um, that maybe some people don't fit into this category of a criminal is meeting a, a woman named Mary, who came into the jail clearly having a psychotic episode. Um, I later found out that she was a veteran, that she had graduated from UNH, had a master's degree from UNH. Um, up until her psychotic episode had been very successful in life. And when I witnessed her 
in a jail cell, um, absolutely terrified of her surroundings, believing that everyone around her looking at her was the devil and saying that we were the devil and that she was actually, she uh, uh, defined herself as the Mother Mary, and no coincidence there was her name, I don't imagine, but, um, and to see this woman in this setting and to learn about her background, I couldn't, I couldn't in my mind say that she was a criminal. I had to say there's something else going on here, and that was actually the catalyst for me deciding that I didn't want to stay in a correctional setting. I actually want to do more work in the community. So when I'm asked, you know, what is a criminal, uh, for me in particular, you know, our mentally ill population, certainly there are criminals amongst that population, but not everyone, and, and same for vice versa. So uh, what is a criminal? Uh, I think someone that willfully and knowingly acts uh, on criminal behavior. Uh, and and from, in my opinion, Mary at that time wasn't that person. So that kind of moved me into the community. Thank you. I, I'll, I can go next because I, I have a very similar um, kind of a experience. I One of the things that was left out of my bio um, when Alex gave it is I was also a public defender. So I went from being a prosecutor to being a public defender um, and also spent those 10 years on the parole board. So I have seen the prosecutor side, the defense side, from the public defense side, and then the, from the prison side. Um, and I'll, I mean, I think that practically speaking, the definition for me of what a criminal is hasn't changed because it's really, to me, depends on what society decides we are gonna criminalize. Personally, I can say that as a prosecutor in a large uh, city, office, like the Manhattan DA's office, and then up here at the AG's office, I didn't really think about the people I was prosecuting as human beings. And when I switched sides, it was really the first time for me that I came face to face with the notion, A, that I had spent many years of my career already doing something that um, I wish I'd had a different perspective on. Um, but also just the, the idea that it, I, I don't even think we can call people criminals. I think that people are human beings with criminal problems or complex problems that have to do with substance abuse, mental health, and sometimes just in, intractable, intractable uh, you know, criminal issues that we can't, um, they can't get out of. So I would say that they, it changed for me significantly uh, when I switched sides and realized the humanity that I had um, in front of me very deeply. Mm. Well, you'd think I know a lot of criminals, but I really haven't met that many. Um, uh, actually, Kate got me thinking about this. I, um, I, I was dealing with humans who were in either crisis mode or were doing something that they know they shouldn't have been doing, but did. and. Hopefully, uh, as my grandfather would say, that which didn't kill you would make you better. And so hopefully that would make everyone better. And certainly policing in the Durham UNH environment is certainly unique. But um, I really, when it comes to who was a criminal, um, I've probably met a handful of them. Um, I was uh, deputy director at Maine Drug Enforcement, which was an undercover covert drug operation where we would um, engage with um, criminal enterprises where that was overtly what they were trying to do, do something illegal to make money. And um, there's a, I think from my experiences in Durham of being police chief here for the last 24 years, um, I think I've probably dealt with maybe five criminals who are just bad people who need to be in jail and um, currently are. And, and I'm talking about um, um, sexual assaults, rapes, armed um, robberies, things of that nature. Um, but there's not many people that, um, you know, you'd think as a police officer for some 40 odd years that I would be able to say I've dealt with a lot of criminals, but they basically just humans in some sort of a crisis or deviant way of behaving, not in a criminal way. And I have to say that um, because the day that I decided I would be a police officer was the day I was arrested for um, hitchhiking on 93 and a state trooper uh, arrested me for, um, and I realized that 
if I was going to say I was a criminal, I suppose I could. Um, but the point is, is that I think there's people who make mistakes, which I did, and um, 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 and then you move on and you learn from the moment that you do. And then what I brought to law enforcement, my hope was the fact that that trooper pigeonholed me. Uh, nice guy that he may have been, but he didn't get a chance to know me. He just saw that I was doing some bad behavior in his mind, and I got arrested. And um, so I don't want to call myself a criminal. <laughs> I'll call you a criminal. Chief. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. You know, we've, we've known each other a long time, Chief Curse and I, and worked together for many years here at UNH. I, I never knew that story. So I'm going to share one of my, I too was arrested uh, by, this was the California Highway Patrol, you know, the chips. Um, and it was for hitchhiking, only I didn't stop, they chased us. And I hid in a culvert underneath the highway, and by God, they found the two of us, and it wasn't pretty. So, you know, uh, I came to UNH to study homicide under a leading researcher who was here at UNH many, many years ago, whose area was homicide, and he had done a seminal work in 1960 on um, why uh, men kill. And I think I chose criminology as a pursuit largely because I was interested in why human beings do things that are otherwise proscribed by law or, you know, moral code or... And I think in sociology, when you're interested in those kinds of things, you have two choices. You can go into the crime and, and law or you can go into mental health. They're called, in fact, in, in sociology, there's a division called deviance and social control. So those are your two choices. As an undergraduate, I spent a couple of days in a mental institution thinking, well, maybe I'll go into mental health. And I was convinced that that was not my forte. So uh, in both cases, I was interested in why human beings behave in the, which way they, they do with the entire range of choices that they have. So I would say over my years of study, um, and um, I too have worked in prisons. I've, I, my doctoral research was down in a, well, at the time, the largest female prison in the country in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's where uh, Joan Little, those of you that may remember that case, where she was sexually assaulted in prison, and then the only woman who's been executed in 70, since 77 in the United States, Velma Barfield, was there at the time. Um, and so I spent the better part of two years and. Um, my days were basically talking only with women who had been convicted of, of some form of criminal homicide. And I was lucky to stay in the house, of, a vacant house owned by the prison doctor at the time. And I had a lamp, a bed, a chair, and one of those little radios. And so uh, I'd be down there two weeks at a time, and my entire day was spent inside that prison talking with women who kill. And then I'd go home to this rat hole and uh, or two weeks of that is enough um, at a time. But, um, uh, you know, after all these years in studying um, why people kill, um, I have to say that I, I'm not sure I have uh, all the answers, but I've learned to ask pretty good questions. So I know the difference between a good question and one that's not as good as it relates to, to what is a criminal uh, and why people engage in criminal behavior. Thanks. That's nicely framed. So it was interesting to me that Sabrina, you said something like, oh, obviously we're not interested in definitions, <laughs> which the title is what is a criminal, but I, I think you're probably right <laughs> that we've sort of veered away from that. We're not only interested, well, I think anybody in this room knows that there is not gonna be a clear definition, right? There's not gonna be some simple thing that you can say. Um, Blair gave us uh, that a criminal willfully and knowingly acts uh, through criminal behavior, I think is what I wrote down. Uh, but, and then Amy said, well, what is a criminal depends on what society decides. And I think Sabrina said something similar. So uh, my next question is, is this big question. Is it a matter of definition? Or would any of you argue that there's some absolute standard that can and should be used to determine criminality? Does anybody want to raise their hand and argue that? <laughs> can I, can I, may I, panelists? So um, I think, 
I think the the cultural loudspeakers, and this has been true is, is historically in this country, we tend to think in terms of criminals. We we love a murder mystery. We love to watch crime shows that are very popular on TV and in film. Um, so there are a lot of cultural memes about that. But I, in actuality, I, I really, I, crime is socially constructed. Um, it, there are some absolutes. There was a, I, I don't want to steal my colleague from philosophy's thunder, but there was a, a prominent um, moral philosopher at Dartmouth for many years. His name was Bernard Gert, and he did a lot of work in understanding, are there any absolutes uh, in human behavior? And he poured through law historically all over the world, uh, moral, religious codes, and he does come up with kind of a list of, it's like the Ten Commandments, things that are commonly shared among cultures and peoples across space and time that are like no-nos and, and do not kill is one of them, but also do not deprive of pleasure and do no harm. Those are common themes in the human story. But it's also true that the definition of crime varies over time and space. And so if you look at marijuana, for example, um, I mean, when I was younger, you know, it was heavily enforced. And of course, the nation's undergoing a change in the way it looks, it looks, it looks at marijuana and its usage. Um, I think there are times when we tend to medicalize behavior. We've talked about mental health, which is a growing problem in the United States. Uh, I happen to think there are good news about that. Um, or we criminalize it. Um, and sometimes it's both. I think in most of our county jails, there are something like 60 or 70 percent of the inmates present with at least one mental health diagnosis. Um, so personally, I think when you ask the question, what is a criminal? I'd argue that each one of us as human beings has the potential to cause serious harm to another person if given the right circumstances. So I've always argued that I could take Mother Teresa and if I could control all of the variables in her life experiences from birth, yes, I could get her to kill somebody. So I think the, the nature-nurture uh, argument, those domain assumptions about human behavior of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, it's a very complicated mosaic in why people actually do very bad things to others. Um, so I think the definition of what is a criminal and, and sometimes what's crime um, changes over time and, uh, and certainly changes over um, geography. One of the things that I'm um, just sitting here that is, um, ha has me pondering is there, there is a definition. It's, it's not that you're a criminal, but for the fact that there's a definition in law that says you are a criminal. And much of my career as a police officer was designed, I suppose, to demonstrate or to prove if a person committed a crime to try to solve it. Who, if someone stole your cell phone, we'd like to solve that. Is that person a criminal? By definition, yes, they are. Uh, is there something else that's going on? Could they have some mental health issues? In fact, I might argue that, you know, uh, a Ted Bundy, a serial killer, who certainly would be defined as a criminal, it just seems to me as a, I'd like hope to think, logical thinking person that this is, has, he has some mental issues that is driving him to kill some, to kill people. And so it, it's um, it's interesting that you know the discussion that's getting me thinking about you know what's a criminal as, as a definition um, that that law makes them or defines them as a criminal if they do these thir certain things. May I argue with my good colleague on the other side? So no, no, you may uh, you may not. <laughs> I will see to you the fact that yes. We codify certain rules that we think are important to our common good and safety that we agree these are bad things to do. And when you violate them, you have violated a criminal statute. But the leap we make is to assume then that you are a criminal. And the unfortunate part of being, of assuming that label and actually internalizing it is, um, you know, it's, it's what sociologists call a master status. So a master status, you could be a hundred things, but it's the one thing that people know about you or refer to you if you're at a cocktail party. So if you've killed somebody, 
or you've robbed 10 banks. You could be an incredible accountant or physician, but trust me, people are whispering you at that cocktail party that you're a murderer or you're a bank robber. Um, so it is a master status, but at what I would argue, at what point, how many laws, how many crimes do you have to commit before you actually earn that title of criminal? Is it one? Is it 10? Is it 20? I'll jump in. Um, I just take issue with one thing that, that you said, um, that across all societies, it, uh, killing is a crime, but we have state-sanctioned killing in our own country. So I don't think that you can even say that, and that leads to my point, which I think there are no absolutes, because there can't be absolutes, and there shouldn't be absolutes, because if you think back, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that sodomy was illegal. Um, interracial marriage was illegal. That made certain classifications or status um, offenders criminals, but we would never want to have that happen today. I mean, we have to allow for a changing society. Um, on the other side of that, I do a lot of research and um, actually teach a course here on sexual violence and uh, the definitions of rape and how we perceive sexual assault and consent has changed in, in, in a way that I think we're criminalizing the behavior more surgically, which is a good thing. Um, so I think it has to change. It can't be absolute. It would be a terrible thing if it was absolute. Jump in. Yeah, I think crime is certainly defined by the society that you're in, um, it's easy to put on the books what a crime is. I think uh, what is a criminal is an opinion. Um, and I wonder, you know, that talking about this, does that title kind of carry you throughout the rest of your life? Because, you know, New Hampshire has statutes in place that allows for annulment. Um, there are, you know, one year, two year annulment periods, seven year annulment periods. So if you're convicted of a crime and you're considered a criminal, if you annul your case and it doesn't show up on a criminal record, are you still a criminal? So I think it's a matter of opinion and how a person views another person. So it strikes me that part of what's going on here is um, the notion criminal is what philosophers call a thick concept. So there's a lot going on in, in the notion. It, it has infused in it um, consideration of the moral order. And I think that part of what um, we're, the perspectives we're operating from uh, is one that uh, that sort of carries along the, 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 the idea that to be a criminal is not just merely to have transgressed the uh, rules and norms of society, but that, but that in doing so, you have in some sense rendered yourself um, uh, problematic with respect to the moral order, um, that you are now a morally defective individual, right? Hence the carrying this um, this label with you for the rest of your life. So when the person says to you at a party, um, introduces you or learns that you are um, a thief or a murderer, it's it's a little bit more than you're having committed this act for which you um, um, you uh, served a certain uh, penalty, a certain went away for a while, etc. It's it's something about it's the statement is supposed to capture something about you as an individual that you are. This is where probably my my ways of thinking about these things come in. That there's something about you, perhaps something essential, an essential feature of you. Uh, is problematic, is defective. And it is that, I think, that we're talking about when we say X is a criminal. I think that that's, that's the sort of um, 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 target that we have in mind. It's really helpful. It's interesting that we ended up with kind of two concepts you know, from sociology, the idea of the master status, and from philosophy, the thick concept. You know, there's something about this idea of a criminal that that defies definition, right? And that's why it makes it an interesting topic <laughs> for us to talk about today. Um, should we open it up for some questions from you? Does anybody have something that uh, you'd like to ask? Go ahead. Um, I feel like we can talk about We're going to wait for the, the mic so we can record. Oh, sorry about that. 
Um, I feel like we can't talk about mass incarceration without talking about um, the sheer amount of people of color that are currently incarcerated. Um, and if we look back at like the Reconstruction Era and the 13th Amendment, um, obviously we have a history of criminalizing people who aren't criminals um, for the sake of the government um, or our own social um, capitalistic whatever desires um, to fit whatever uh, money-wise we need. Um, and so even in today's society, we see um, especially um, young men of color being labeled criminals before they've done anything wrong. Um, so how do we, um, in your own opinion, kind of uh, deal with that? And how does that affect uh, an entire community psychologically um, being labeled a, a criminal? Um, and if we're talking about what even is a criminal, if we don't have a definition, how are we defining young people by that definition? That, that's a great question. Uh, and I think it points to the notion of uh, one of the cultural uh, memes, and, and my colleague pointed this out in philosophy, there was a time at the turn of the last century, from the 19th to the 20th century, where many of our colleagues in psychology were enamored of William James, who really thought the commission of crime is a moral failure. So if you're in jail, assuming the system is just, you must be not a nice person. But in fact, the, the disparity in incarceration rates um, across the identities that inform you know, the human story uh, there is differential treatment. Um, and if you, if you get outside of communities of color and just talk about comparing, say, homicide rates cross-nationally, so the fact is the Canadian homicide rate is lower than it is in the United States. Does that mean that Canadians are just nicer, more moral people than those people in the United States? We must be terrible our homicide rate, and at one point it was quite high globally compared to other nations in the world. So it points for me to other structural forces that are at play that might explain why crime occurs rather than the individual model of some moral failing or some flaw. One of my favorite photographs uh, that I thought was indicative of the way that the larger society sees crime and the criminal uh, was in Psychology Today. I don't even know if they print that these days. They're these great covers. It was kind of a popular magazine of the research that our colleagues in experimental so, uh, psychology were engaged in. And it was a picture of a dozen eggs with a you know a little crate open. So the, the little cardboard thing was open. They were beautiful eggs. Except one of them was a hand grenade. You know, and it's this assumption that there is indeed a bad egg out there. And so I think when we unfortunately attach certain types of people with propensities to engage more in this behavior rather than that, it's a fallacy because you really should be looking at more structural rather than individual level uh, origins of, for the reasons for that disparity. Um, I, 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 I really think that that's, a, that's an important question, and uh, an important terrain to try and sort through um, in trying to have intelligent, um, serious conversations about these issues. How many people know um, what the 13th Amendment is? You're going to have an over-representation with this group. <laughs> um, do you want to tell them? So it, I, in my own very limited knowledge. Oh. Sorry. In my limited knowledge, what I know the 13th Amendment to be is um, slavery was considered illegal except in instances where someone was considered um, a criminal. That if they were um, incarcerated, that they, you are legally able to have slavery. Um, and as, as far as I know, that's still um, legal. So the 13th Amendment, as far as I know, is still an amendment. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's interesting. I was actually having this very conversation with my spousal unit last night. Um, this is actually right slap in his territory. He taught 
um, uh, his course, his class today was about the 13th Amendment. Um, and not here at UNH. Um, um, so here's something that I find really fascinating, worryingly fascinating. Um, if you say to a lot of Americans, do you think that the Constitution is a good guiding uh, um, uh, device for the construction of our society? And some people, a lot of people will have good things to say about it. And some people might have some gripes, right? But I think in general, people will say, yeah, it's afforded us um, uh, a society that uh, uh, eventually uh, did the right thing in not enslaving human beings, for instance. Um, we have a, a, um, a, a system of governance that apportioned the responsibilities in a way such that no one branch of the government is carrying all the burdens, right? So there's some really good things. Um, but here we have this 13th Amendment that sits there. Uh, and really, when you think about it, you don't even need to do any fancy logic. When you think about it, and you think of the conditions, the actual observable conditions of the lives of people who are incarcerated, the 13th Amendment is not just on the books, it's actually operational, right? And so we, we end up, we're, we're doing all this really interesting stuff. We're doing research and we're trying to get um, laws on the books and we're trying to modify um, 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 requirements for, uh, for incarceration, rules for incarceration. But we're doing all of that in the midst of this 13th Amendment, which is there allowing us, uh, uh, supposedly, a uh, party to what we're doing. It is party to the ways in which we enslave each other. We, it, we enslave each other, we, um, we incarcerate each other. Ah, that was an interesting slip, wasn't it? It was actually not a slip, Freud would say. Um, um, so, so I think that that's a really, really important question. But I want to pull back a little bit, and I really don't want to take up too much time, but I want to pull back. I think a real useful question is to, to ask, how is it, how is it that we could have a rationalistic legal system that saw it fit and, see, and continue to see it fit to incarcerate so many human beings who roughly fall into certain categories. They're racialized uh, black and therefore less than. They're racialized uh, as not white people and therefore they're not, um, they're not, they're not afforded uh, the legal and protect and, and moral and, and moral um, um, and moral deserts that we afford other people, right? Uh, I think if you're a Martian and you came down here and you look at the actual uh, numbers of people in the prison system, you would ask yourself the question: What is it about those people such that in such great numbers they're incarcerated? I think you ought to. And when you ask the question and you try to figure it out, I think the only source you would get an answer from is something like, it's got to be something in them, right? So I think that we're not doing vulgar eugenics anymore, right? Our eugenics practices are very fancy and refined and sophisticated and nobody talks about, uh, you know, those people, we don't have them procreating and the like. But we are engaging practices which communicates something to us about what we think about some human beings, what fundamentally some human beings are. And I think, really, now to address your question or, or, or your issue, I think the only way we can sort out where we are and get to a better place is if we go back and think about those initial assumptions. Those initial assumptions that some human beings, perhaps being from poverty in conjunction with being um, racialized black, uh, ups the, the, the odds of you being someone who goes to prison if you commit, if you, if you engage in certain courses of action that the state deems problematic, right? So I think unless we question that biological peace, which we may call something like um, um, uh, just how people are, we could say human nature, and, and, and or, or those are the kinds of phrase, unless we peel back at that, then I don't think the fixes that we're making at the surface levels will actually get to the heart of it. We have to revise fundamentally, in my view, what we think of people who are racialized a particular way. I'll say too, you know, once they're incarcerated, 63% um, of the country's incarcerated people are pretrial. 
So, you know, one of my roles with the county is to supervise people in pretrial services, which is essentially like probation on a county level to make sure that people are of good behavior and that they show up to court. And so there's this whole movement with bail reform across the entire country. There's this um, association called National Association of Pretrial Services Agencies where they've released their 2019 standards. And they've said very plainly, these are not aspirational standards that they've set, the expectation is that everyone will do away with money bail. And so when you talk about you know, disproportionate groups, you know, disproportionately being um, incarcerated and for length of time, you know, low income and minority people are being held in jail for longer because they can't afford to post cash bail. Um, an example I give when I speak to high school students is, let's say you have Joe Smith down the street go into a store, steal a bottle of water, get arrested down the street, and um, gets put in jail on $50 cash bail. Joe happens to be homeless, he has no family, um, he has no job, no place to live. Beyonce, for some reason, strolls into the same store and wants just this natural high, so she steals a bottle of water, gets arrested. Who's getting out of jail? <laughs> Who's really the risk, right? Beyonce could buy a country right now and disappear, right? <laughs> Joe Smith's not going to do that. Joe Smith's going to be in the same place he's been his entire life. So when we talk about risk and bail, there are really positive things happening in the country. Um, those 63% of people that sit in jail waiting for their trial are three times more likely to get additional incarceration. They may just give up and say, forget it, I'll just take a plea deal. Like, whatever that plea deal is, I just want it to be over with. I don't know how many of you know Meek Mill, rapper Meek Mill, right? So this guy gets arrested, goes to jail, gets found guilty, claims his innocence the entire time, ends up on pro probation for years, has no issues on probation, gets caught in New York, I think, popping a wheelie on his four-wheeler, right? Goes back to prison. Now the guy's got millions of dollars, he gets a good high-paid attorney, and his conviction was just recently overturned. And so it's, for me, the, the, the question is money. It's all about money. And fortunately, that's something we're finally starting to do away with. So that's, that's a really positive kind of silver lining to the really negative of, of your question. Thank you for your question. Yeah, this is great to point out that actually being in the justice system, whether you committed the crime in the first place or not, can give you the status of criminality, right? Um, as, I mean, we could talk about uh, plea bargaining and other aspects of the justice system, too. But uh, let's go to another question. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the transition between victim to criminal. Specifically, it strikes me that a lot of children who experience violence or neglect then go on to be part of the criminal justice system, be part, you know, involved in that. And specifically, foster care children in particular have very high rates of, of incarceration, I believe. And so I'm, I'm just interested in what you have to say that why we consider people victims up until the age of 18, and then when they act out on their childhood experiences after that, they become criminals. And I, I just would like to hear your responses. Know that I have a response, but I do think that we criminalize youthful offenders. So I, I think that they can make that transition a lot sooner than when they turn 18. Um, and it's you know for all the reasons that they've had a you know they've been in foster care, they've had violence in the home, but you know we have juvenile courts that are full. I'm sure you know all about that. Um, so I, I think it's a problem. I don't have an answer for you, and I'm not a I'm not a sociologist, but it happens much sooner and begins a track for a lot of juvenile offenders much sooner than is probably necessary, given their circumstances. I'm thinking that both Dave and Ted work very directly with people on this cusp of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of um, entering adulthood and, and what gets criminalized and what doesn't. I'm, I wonder if you have thoughts about that. Um. I still go with my definition because um, w one of the things I was thinking about was we're talking about criminals, but I also have to deal with a lot of victims. And we could put a group of people here that handle victims who uh, are not satisfied by the system themselves. And, um, you know, you, um, we, as a police chief, I'm just the custodian for the Durham Police Department for a short period of time. So all I can hope to do and to achieve is to have a responsive police department to 
um, not only people who are defined as criminals at that moment that we're dealing with that meet a criteria under law, and that's my world, and then I have to go to the prosecuting attorney and make sure that we've, def we've proven every element of that crime so that we can prove the case against this person. On the flip side, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the number of um, victims, um, and with my relationship with SHOP, as close as it is, I've learned to say survivor. And what's interesting about that is that we try to put as much focus on the survivors of these incidents as we possibly can. So when we're dealing with people who are defined as criminals and we're de dealing with people who are also now victims of these defined criminals, then uh, we have to have a police force, police force, I hated this, all of a sudden I didn't like saying that, but a police department that is um, responsive to both those needs in a you know, unscientific way, but a hopefully a compassionate way. Um, so uh, I get your question about does um, exposure to victimization actually increase the likelihood of offending later on? And the answer is yes. So I think there's a fair amount of empirical evidence that particularly early age exposure, the more that you have exposure to life events that would be characterized as aggression, meaning aggression towards you, and those that are characterized by loss of some sort, um, it could be a death, could be your house burns down, the more that you have those exposures to both of those types of events, the more likely you are to adopt what we might call um, behavior that others in the uh, 19th and 20th century would call a moral failing. It's a very, so that's, that's the part of my response that we know. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off script a little bit and said I think what the connector is that when you have that exposure, what you're doing, and this is not as empirically borne out, that you develop a sense of um, isolation and hostility. And so if you look at all of these offenders that are do some pretty bad things, my own take um, is that there is, it, you know, I'm a big fan of the subjective construction of reality. Um, and they begin to see the entire world as, as isolating and hostile towards them. So why not? And I'll, you don't have to do much for me to really get ticked off. Um, as far as young people go, I have to say, it may not seem that way, but New Hampshire is actually a fairly progressive state as it relates to issues of juvenile justice. So I serve in the state advisory group on juvenile justice, which basically is a funnel of all state funds that come in to ameliorate delinquency and, and to support prevention. Um, and so the whole juvenile justice system is really designed to take children at risk who are engaging in behavior that's otherwise disvalued and try to do what they can to wick them away from any contact with the official system because the more contact at a young age that you have with the justice system, juvenile or otherwise, the more likely you are to actually support uh, later criminal behavior. Um, and the detention center that we have in Manchester, the Sununu Center, it, the, they're in working with the district court, with working with faith-based organizations, with juvenile probation and parole officers. Um, the whole system is designed, if a, if a child appears before the court, to try not to incarcerate, basically, in kitty prison at Sununu. So at any one time in the state of New Hampshire, we have a population of, I think, 1.5 million, roughly. And uh, on a good day, there are only about 35 kids that are at the Sununu Center and maximum of about 55. So it is a good thing, and they also have as a priority to try to address what used to be called um, uh, dispro disproportionate minority contact. Um, somebody mentioned how social class, panelists and, and, and all of you, uh, that's really the hidden injury in this country in a market economy. We talk a lot about race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Social class means a lot, and we don't talk enough about it in this country. So there are have-nots, um, and uh, they're disadvantaged in the system. But 
Um, there's a lot of work that's going on in this state. It's now instead of called disproportionate minority contact, it's called racial and ethnic disparity, RED, R-E-D. And it's really designed to drill down to those communities where there's a high number of underrepresented students, young people in that population, and do what they can in a prevention method to wick them away from any contact with the police um, or with the juvenile justice system. It's ongoing work, but I think the metrics that New Hampshire has as our um, population of, of youth um, of color um, is actually promising because that's the fastest growing population demographic in this state. In this state of New Hampshire, the white death rate exceeds the white birth rate, and yet the population is increasing. So you can figure out what's happening in this state. The demography is changing in this state as it is in Maine, and we're gonna be a very different state in 15 years than we are now. Hi. Uh, so do you consider something immoral and therefore criminal about the plea bargain when the person isn't guilty, uh, since it's inherently lying under oath, or is it the circumstance of a villain or of a victim? Uh, and is it every individual's responsibility to fight against the system that favors plea bargains, or is it the responsibility of government or the system itself to change how plea bargaining benefits innocent people who lie? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're talking about the morality of plea bargaining and also the system of plea bargaining. Amy, I feel like you're the go-to person on this. <laughs> um, we talk about this in my criminal law class quite a bit. It's, it's, it's just astounding to me. Um, there's so much law written about so many things in criminal procedure courses in our school and criminal law. I mean, all... all Criminal law and criminal procedure has so much um, scholarship, cases, all of, all of the things that we study in the law. There's virtually nothing in the table of contents that says plea bargaining, yet it's 98% of the people who come into the criminal justice system. Um, and that's because there's no law around plea bargaining. There's very little kind of procedure, due process, any of the things that we think of as kind of accompanying our criminal justice system. Um, and it's, the problem is that it's so much down to what the prosecutor has got the discretion to do. I mean, at the first instance, it's the police, um, but prosecutors have so much power and they're often untrained, um, inexperienced, or have political motives. Um, and I mean, I don't even know what to say. I could go on and on and on, so it's hard for me to say just a, a short sound bite on this, but it's, it's a huge problem. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to think about, and this is sort of an answer to the question about mass incarceration, is how do we structurally change how the prosecutors operate? So this isn't, you know, there's this great serial podcast um, that takes place in uh, Cleveland. And one of the lines in that is, in Cleveland, uh, innocence is a misdemeanor. And, you know, that's, that's plea bargaining. You know, you just plead to get out. And you're right that you basically have to talk about a way that's sort of legal fiction in front of a court of law, so you are sort of lying. Um, but that's a structural change that really starts with how we think of and change prosecutor's offices, and that is changing. I mean, there's a lot more kind of progressive um, thought now. Elections seem like they're turning towards just in Merrimack County, the county I'm in. We just elected a public defender as a, as a uh, county attorney. That's not happened in the 20-something years I've been here. So things are changing, but it's it's... Uh, anyway, I could really talk for a long time. But I, don't I think Dave wants to respond. I didn't mean to um, do that while you were talking. I apologize. Um, what, for, for us, I hear what you're saying about the expediency, and it's just easy to plead guilty. There's nothingness of a crime as opposed to be subjected to the other one that they've charged me with. So I understand what you're saying. That's not my world, um, uh, certainly in this court system. Uh, for us, it's, it's a matter of reality. It's expediency. The Durham Police Department has six hours of court time a month, a, a, a month that we have to deal with these, all these trials that we just can't simply deal with. So it's a matter of us 
um, um, creating opportunities for plea bargains that are advantageous. And again, our clientele that we're arresting, and that's what we ref we refer to them as clientele, is that um, it's generally not any significant thing. It might be uh, in the scheme of life. Um, it's it's probably like if the alcohol issue, for instance, uh, that many of you may find yourselves in uh, if you're under the age of 21, impacts your license. You may lose your license in the state of New Hampshire. So the town of the town police department uh, offers you a plea bargain if you'll plead guilty to this offense of possessing alcohol at under 21 to what the town ordinance is for an open container, which has nothing to do with state law or will not impact your license as a considered a violation under the law. But that's, it's expedient for you, it's reality for us, and I hear what you're saying about the plea bargain situation in where it becomes expedient, but um, I think the world in this particular area of New Hampshire, for the most part of New Hampshire, um, it becomes just a fiscal reality because we don't have time to have a trial, and if there are trials, they'll push it back months and months and months, and then witnesses disappear, and you don't see them anymore, and we can't prosecute the case, so, which may be a strategy unto itself, I suppose. Kate, can I ask my question? Yes. So, so I'm wondering, um, is, uh, is, um, is there a legal uh, statute or something um, that, that codifies uh, plea bargains? I mean, how do you get to do that if you say No, there's not. <laughs> Does anybody need plea bargaining defined? I realize I should have asked that earlier, but are we all clear on what plea bargaining is? I do. <laughs> okay. Amy, please define plea bargaining. Well, I mean, I can, I'll just describe a, a day in the life um, when I was a prosecutor. So, for example, in Manhattan, we had night court. So when I was working there, I don't know if they have it anymore, but we would have 24-hour arraignments. So we'd be assigned for seven days in a week to what we call the lobster ship, which was 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. Um, you do seven day shifts and if you, that's what you do as a rookie uh, prosecutor in Manhattan. And during that time they bring in, you know, they're just bringing in, you know, people to be arraigned and um, we would make deals right there in the courthouse with the public defenders. The prosecutors would talk to the public defenders and say, look, you know, we'll give you a misdemeanor a violation disorderly conduct if you plead down this um, you know, trespass or this drug possession or whatever it is, and you just have this very quick deal, um, and, and the defendant would then take the plea, and really quick, the judge would sometimes, you know, in those scenarios would be like applauding us if we would get rid of more cases, and, you know, that's the way it worked. There, there was, um, it, there was almost like a factory feeling about it, and in answer to your question, the only thing that is really guiding you as a prosecutor are your ethical rules. I mean, as a lawyer, you have to abide by certain ethical rules, and that's true for a judge. You know, they can't take, if they think that there, there's really a taking a plea that's against the weight of the evidence, then, you know, they're, they really shouldn't do that. Um, defense attorneys have the same ethical rules. But there are, on the margins, some things that you can fight, you know, on due process-wise when you have a problem with a plea bargain that, that you've taken as a um, as an offender, but generally, I would say that once you've agreed to take a plea, you've kind of waived your right to to do anything. And I mean, I, I think what I what I think we we looking back over the years, I I think now when we were plea bargaining, why wasn't the option just to drop the charge? You know, we didn't think that way. And you, I mean, and actually, that's not you know that's sort of so you. If you have an open container, you still have that open container on your record. Like, if what's really needed is just a little counseling, why not? Why aren't we dropping that charge and saying, you know, you don't really belong in the system? We're going to let you go with this kind of treatment or this thing that you need. But you know, bargaining is a bargain. You know, so people have to walk away feeling like I I did well in the bargain. I guess. I mean, that's, I mean, my experience is so different because I was in a very large urban environment. And then um, I, you know, when I was up here in AG's office, that, that was, those were big cases. So they, there wasn't a lot of plea bargaining there. So. Just a quick follow-up on this question. 
sorry, quick follow up on this question about plea bargaining. Um, I think several people in the room have seen Ava DuVernay's 13th. And uh, for me, anyway, that was one of the gasp moments of the film. You haven't seen it. So it. she, you know, she, it's, yeah, it's on Netflix, I think, still, and it's wonderful. You should see it. Um, but um, Sabrina wants you to see it right now. Um, the, she shows a, an example of a kid who um, um, is wrongly picked up by the police and refuses to plea bargain because he's like, I didn't do anything and in Manhattan, actually, or somewhere in, somewhere in New York City. Yeah. And um, he ends up in jail for, I think, two years or something, uh, many, many months, um, having terrible, terrible problems, uh, getting mentally and ment mentally worse and worse over time. And um, uh, eventually, when he's finally released and the charges are dismissed because he had nothing to do with anything that went on that night that the police, for some reason, stopped him about, um, you know, he, he survives a, I don't know how many more months and commits suicide eventually. He's just so drilled down by the whole experience and so beaten up by it mentally and physically. Uh, and then in that, in that context, we hear from, uh, a, another legal scholar who says that, you know, actually, you know, 90 something percent, you just mentioned the statistics too, of, of all cases end in a plea bargain. And if we, if everyone insisted on going to trial, the legal system would collapse. And so you know, at that moment, that was my gasp moment. And of course, it's very effectively done from the filmmaker's perspective because that's the frame in which we're looking at plea bargaining. We're not thinking about open containers or you know anything like that. We're thinking about just wrenching questions of social justice and the and the killing of our children, really, you know, when it comes down to it. So I, at that moment, so we have this wonderful opportunity with all of you brilliant people in the room <laughs> to just focus on that. I mean, should we just blow up the legal system or the criminal justice system so that this is not the way it works? Because maybe the plea bargain, you know, is appropriate in some, in some uh, scenarios, right? And maybe that's why it exists to the extent that it does. But isn't it also possible, um, as you, I think, are starting to suggest, that we radically rethink it and, for example, not allow it anymore? Like, if, if, if we just are going to do a plea bargain where the prosecuting side gets something out of it too, right? Like, not no charge, but something, because I want something. Like, what, why do you need anything? You're not a kid about to go to jail or not. Um, so can, is that even in, do you think, um, the realm of possibility over the next 10 or 20 years as people try to change the criminal well, justice system. Yeah. Well, I don't know, yeah, any of you all. I mean, I, I have to say that one word comes to mind and that's politics. Okay, yeah, I think that a wholesale change is in order and that the first thing that has to happen is decriminalization and more services like yours, yeah. you know, the pretrial services. That costs money, taxpayers don't wanna pay it, Politicians run on low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit is, you know, back in the 90s, the, the, the wilding, the you know, huge increase in juvenile crime. And you be very afraid, be very afraid. I will protect you and, you know, make these laws happen. And, you know, that's politics. And, and I mean, do you want to pay? Do you want more, to pay more tax so that you can have better a better system? I think that's a... That's something people have a hard time with. They don't want to pay for it, and it costs money. So we could just decriminalize a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I think it's great we're decriminalizing marijuana, but maybe there's a lot more categories of things we should decriminalize. I think Stephen might have a follow-up. Oh, well, it loops around, actually. You just nicely looped back to what I wanted to bring up. I feel like we could sharpen, maybe, a few of the things that have come out of the discussion and particularly what arose from the great question about the 13th Amendment. Um, one of the things, there are huge sections of our law code which are designed to criminalize people. It's not just that there's a law code and it's this neutral thing that exists. And if you happen to be poor, you're more likely to break it, right? People, black people are criminalized. You know, we, we have, I mean, the reason marijuana is criminalized in this country is so that people with brown skin and black skin can be arrested, right? Crack cocaine 
crack cocaine versus like we have all of these examples and the fact is is that if you look at 13th and a whole bunch of other things right this is we, we criminalize black males we criminalize poor people we criminalize young people right we criminalize the drinking of a beer that i can do right and we and we make it into this public health crisis and all these other things but we but this is not we a kind of neutral it's been mentioned a couple times society develops law codes and develop standards these are these are people doing it and not everybody has an equal voice in creating those law codes and many people are the victims of this law code and it seems to me that we shouldn't necessarily just talk about it as if it's a natural process all societies develop normative standards by which we judge citizens the, the, we have a very particular history in this country and i think that we have to think about it and what needs to be decriminalized in order to stop it's not just sodomy it's not just an act that is criminalized sodomy was criminalized right to go after gay men it was not just oh we don't like this act we don't like gay men and that we who is the we these are the things that i think we need to to sharpen a little bit of our language and thinking on so you're really kind of reversing the frame here so rather than criminals are people who commit crimes crimes are things done by people we already think are criminals So this is this is really good um, because I, so part part of what I think is going on is sort of um, a mixing of the legal criminal and um, moral categories the uh, domains right so there's a domain of the moral which is not the domain of the legal but I think it's fair to say uh, Americans like to say uh, we have. Um, 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 Judeo, uh, Judeo Christian, we're a Judeo Christian <laughs> nation, right? Uh, wherein the the structuring of the nation came out of that tradition, right? Um, and part of what happened is uh, the the building blocks for the construction of a culture of the cultural framework is in part out of that tradition, that religious tradition about the dictates of right action, good action, bad actions, right? Clearly, we can see a line from the criminal, uh, criminalizing uh, homosexuality um, and, uh, and certain other kinds of sexual behaviors when we look at uh, our well, vulgar understanding of the biblical, of, 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 of the biblical, um, of, of religious text. Um, and so there is, it seems to be, a connection at least, a colloquial connection perhaps, and, and I think in some sectors um, it's, it's perhaps uh, a connection that is more substantive but is not articulated between our religious traditions and the legal system that we have in place. Unless that coupling of the two is severed, in my view, we're always going to be in this place, right? Because mm. to, 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 to have a problem with homosexuality legally is to read the Bible in a particular way, right? And so, unless we're willing to address that, really separation of state and church and state, then we're not going to be open to genuinely rectifying the legal sphere. So I think that's part of what's going on, the, the coupling of the moral and the legal, when we think that almost the one is a synonym for the other. Just to sort of piggyback on um, what was just said and the great question that we had at the beginning, it seems like it's more than just sort of codifying certain behaviors as being illegal because certain segments of the population tend to engage in those behaviors more so than other segments of the population. Seems to me like we've gotten even more bold, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this isn't something that's new, maybe it's just being publicized more now, but it seems to me like we're attaching the label criminal to certain segments of the population before they've done anything wrong. I can reach in my glove compartment to get my license and registration out and be safe. Other people that's seen as a criminal behavior and they suffer with the loss of their lives, they're executed right there. And people who engage in those behaviors, executing them, seem to be getting away with it. Um, so we've always criminalized, I think, people 
call them criminals after they've done their debt to society. They can't vote, they, can't, they still carry that label with them. Now we seem to be adding that label to certain segments of the population before they've even done anything. Any comments from anybody on that? Yeah, I would say that that is nothing new. So I think if you, uh, and I, I completely agree with Professor Trascoma's argument that another way to look at this is in human fair affairs, there is a duality between the powerful and the powerless. And the powerful are going to design a system that benefits them and, and disadvantages the powerless. So don't think that in the 1920s this wasn't happening. Um, I think if, any, if there's any good news, it's that we're actually talking about it now. So think about the people that suffered under this system with no outlet to express outrage about that. Um, so I, I, I think you're both right. And I, I think that I tend to see things from that dispassionate view as a sociologist. But there's no mistake in my mind that the social structure in which we live is designed, which includes codified law and the legal system and the way that it operates, is designed to benefit some and disadvantage others. And that's how it plays out, you know, in the streets. I'm sorry, I have another question. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. They're very different, so I apologize. Um, but my first question is, um, going off of what was said before about the criminalization of homosexuality, um, I recently read a book about queer history. And I know um, in the past, there was a habit in police departments where they would send out uh, female police officers and to have them cut their hair and look like lesbians and send them out to gay bars and try to get picked up by other lesbians and then ask them to come home with them. And then the second they were out of the bar, they would handcuff them. Um, and you know that kind of uh, baiting behavior still happens. Um, especially with uh, people of color and um, with, uh, with other minority communities. Um, and I, I'm just very curious uh, from a, a law perspective of why that happens and why that isn't illegal and why we do that. Um, and my other very different question is um, I've noticed that to become a lawyer, you have to have a lot of schooling. You have to go to school for a really long time. Why don't we have that same standard for police officers? You know, for police officers, it feels like you can become a police officer within a year or two. Um, and it can be a quick choice. Like, oh, I just I want to be a police officer. And then you just go and do that. There isn't as much training. And you need to know the law. You don't have to pass the bar exam. Um, yet these are the people that are directly, um, even physically touching the people we've deemed as immoral and criminals. Um, so why is that? And is that something that should change? Dave, you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, Dave. What? <laughs> um, yes, you're right. There should be a lot of training for police officers. Um, but what was striking me, and it happened in Kate's class and other places where I've been, where we talk about um, uh, implicit bias, and you were painting with a pretty wide brush and talking about, um, well, as a police officer. It's like, I remember years ago, I went to uh, Dick Humilly's office. He was the hockey coach here a few years ago. And the minute I appeared in his office, he went, what? <laughs> like, I'm bad news, right? And all I was trying to do was sign my son up for the hockey camp. <laughs> and, and so th there's an automatic brush that you were painting with that all police are bad. There are very bad police officers, and there are very good police officers. So just like there are a whole bunch of us we can categorize in that way, get to know us first. It's appreciative of the fact that police have a lot of power. We can take away your right to, um, to be free. We can put you in a jail. We can use deadly force under some circumstances. And then we have to define that by law and, and justify it. So this is where it becomes somewhat complicated because we're somewhat parochial about policing in that 
um, the, the town of Durham. I'm a good police chief in Durham, but I may be a lousy police chief in some other community that does not have the same thinking that I perceive that the town of Durham wants policing done by. So for instance, you know, we focus a lot on um, um, being guardians. I essentially do a marriage vow to my community. Uh, every August, I commit to them that we're going to get deliver policing in this style and that if we make a mistake, we'll admit it and try to get better at it. The trouble is when we make a mistake, it's pretty significant generally. You know, someone loses their right to freedom and all these other things. So I hear what you're saying. There's no question about it. Um, but again, it comes down to politics, political fortitude, money. Um, training police officers is very expensive. And the, the town of Durham allows me, for instance, to hire young, moldable people who we believe will be very good police officers in the town of Durham because of this unique environment that we are, we're in. So you're absolutely right, but you're talking, again, it's all politics, and it really comes down to how much money and then responsibility. I mean, if you see something that's wrong, say something, and then on the flip side, be prepared to have the dialogue as to what happened and why. Dave, I know you've mentioned that you've had trouble filling positions in recent years. I think you do have a pretty high standard for who you're willing to hire, right? And and do you want to talk at all about that sure. issue? I mean, it's, it's a nationwide phenomenon that's really problematic right now because police are not particularly uh, uh, enamored right now. It's not really what a lot of people want to go into. We've been somewhat fortunate. The last, um, virtually everyone that works on the Durham Police Department has a bachelor's degree or a master's degree for currently our UNH grads um, who, you know, not that we've sought them out, but we, we'd love to have you understand your environment and we go through a lot of um, screening to choose the right people. Uh, we've, I, uh, Nancy's here who I, ha as a citizen rep in the, um, has been on our oral boards and inevitably and those, those people who sit on the oral board that I've invited to come to give us input, say, I don't know anything about policing, but you do know who you want to come down your walkway and to deal with your most intimate problem. Is this the person sitting here or isn't it? And if, if it is, basically, you know, common sense is not that common, but we try to find that person who we can mold to be that kind of compassionate, caring police officer, because even after we arrest a criminal, we have to treat them like a human. You know, I, I would say in fairness to the chief, too, I think the most progressive voices in law enforcement across the country, on balance, not always on balance, are the chiefs. I think that you'd have no argument that they're trying to go after the educated, best and brightest for those positions. And I think, uh, you know, in my work here at UNH, for UNH students that want to be police officers, a while back, 10 years ago, the chiefs uh, came and said, can you, can you develop the pool a little bit? Um, and so we, we started to work with students that wanted to be police officers. But when I would sit down and talk to somebody, you have to ask, why is it that you want to be a police officer? And sometimes, I don't know if Chief Kurz agrees, sometimes it's the reluctant who, who make the best police, police officers. officers. And you don't want the person that wants to put on that badge, you know. Is it? I'll tell you, when I was doing my graduate work here, I, I worked as a maximum security guard in the prison in Concord, and I'd stop by the graduate warren when I would be on my way back from the shift, and I'd have my uniform on with a badge, and people said, you know, you walk a little taller with that on, you know, and it is, it is something to wear that, um, and you can never... Poli incidentally, police officer is another master status. If we're all at a party, particularly if all of you are over imbibing, and the chief walks in, and he's, he's off duty, what are we going to say? Hey, psst, he's the chief of police. That's his master status. And for cops, that's true. It's a tough job, and I think we need to encourage more young people in the community who have higher emotional quotients, because that is the most powerful weapon that a, 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 an officer has. It's not the sidearm. It's the ability to work and engage with people and to diffuse kind of tension on the street. Because after all, they're designed to protect all of our safety. Unfortunately, in some parts of this country, they work with the system 
to actually further suppress and exploit people from marginalized communities. And that includes people who are have-nots, low-income people. Uh, there was a recent instance where there was a police officer who had been trained in crisis training, and he talked down um, a, a man who was a man of, uh, I think he was black, um, and he had a weapon on him, and he was threatening to shoot other people. And the police officer engaged him and was able to talk him down, was able to get um, him away from the weapon, and another police officer showed up to the scene, panicked, and shot him, and the man died. Um, and the man who initially talked him down and de-escalated the situation was fired from his police department um, for not acting the way that he should have. Um, and I don't know. I, I'm I'm very uneducated in this aspect. I don't know if that's something that is um, that's a rarity, um, or if that is often done in police departments. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but what that tells me is there's a bad culture in that entire organization that if the standard is now being reinforced that um, uh, shooting the person is what is what we want here in this police department because you were just rewarded by keeping a job. Being, the person who was fired was the one who was thinking, trying to act in, like a human and, and save this person. And that then sends the message to the entire organization that this behavior is not accepted, this one is accepted. And that's a problem. There's no question about it. And you had said about you know painting a broad brush, and I agree, I understand, and I, I don't want to come across that like I hate the police or any of that sort of thing. However, um, as a woman of color, and um, I went to school, I went to high school in Hartford, Connecticut, um, and Hartford, Connecticut has a nickname of being called Homicide Hartford within the kids my age that go to school there because the homicide rate is so high. Um, and there was always issues with the police officers that were at our school. Um, there was a very high distrust of the police. Um, and I guess all I would ask you mm -hmm. is, and I, all you can do is control yourself, and is to um, you know, engage us. Um, you you want to go for a ride with a police officer some night? I'll make that happen. Seriously. We can put you on the other side of the windshield and see what happens and what doesn't happen. My personal perspective is I don't have any I don't have any issues with the police, but how do we start those conversations within young people of you know, it seems a little bit, um, I had a conversation with it, an, an administrative um, person in my high school, very um, little, sweet, blonde, white lady. And she was like, I don't understand why all these, these the kids of color hate me. And I was like, I said to her, you have to look at the, the history, you know, the Emmett Till situation. A little white blonde lady was, oh, I was victimized and everyone believed her. Um, so there is a there is a cultural distrust uh, distrust within communities of color within um, with people uh, especially white people in power and that may not be my perspective but from the perspective of other students that I have interacted with like how do we solve that and how do we um, I, I know I personally don't believe that you know m most people, white people that are in positions of power are evil or that they're out to get me or any of those sorts of things. But there are kids that genuinely feel that way because of the situations that they've brought, been brought up in and the things that they've experienced. Like, how do we start those conversations and how do we solve that problem? One of the things that, is it okay if I jump in? Yes, please. And I think we had a question back there so we can pass the mic back. Thank um, you. One of the things, I mean, the way that you can help is in the vote, voting booth, basically, because what you're talking about is there there needs to be accountability police officers need to be accountable at least to another agency right not just internally and one of the issues that i mean i saw a huge difference between the culture in manhattan new york county and when i came up to new hampshire it's it's virtually unheard of up here for the uh ag's office or prosecutor's offices to investigate or prosecute or you know, kind of go after a police officer, or police department for any kind of misconduct. It's just not done because the two agencies are sort of go hand in hand. And in many places, that's not true. You know, there is a, you know, more of a culture of police, prosecutors, defenders, you know, and, and prosecutors hold as, you know, hold, hold the police as much accountable as they do anybody else. They're not just sort of going together as a team. 
And that's your elected officials. I mean, your AG's office, you know, your, your attorney generals, your local prosecutors. Ask the question, are you willing to prosecute a police officer? You know, what for? What's your standard? You know, how do you think they should be held accountable? Um, I think that there's a real culture in many places where there this feeling that they there shouldn't be this divide, you know, and I think that's a problem. And it's kind of it goes down to what you're talking about is who's who's watching, who's who's doing that, who's deterring the police. Is this on? Oh, okay, that's really loud. All right. So kind of, I guess, picking back up, piggybacking off of the question that was asked a little bit ago and also going back to something that was said earlier. So I really appreciated the answers that I heard, but what I didn't hear answered was what's the value in changing the educational requirements for police officers in comparison to that of like things like lawyers and judges and that profession? And is there, I guess, is there value in doing that and holding them to maybe not the same standard, but a similar standard of understanding of not just the law, but the cultural and societal context that they're working within. And then the question that relates to earlier is someone, we talked a lot about like legalizing marijuana and things like that. And that made me think, what's the value? I mean, I mean, I personally think it, it'd be a great idea, but what's the value in um, mm -hmm. letting people out or letting people out who've been prosecuted for crimes that are no longer criminal. Like, what do we do with people who are in there for something that we no longer see as criminal? I'm gonna add something to that real quick. So I think uh, I'd be curious if anyone might have uh, an international comparative perspective on kind of police training. I, I know anecdotally that police training in Germany, I think takes three years. Whereas I think, uh, I don't know if there's a standard in US police academies. I'd be curious to hear anything on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the New Hampshire Police Academy becomes certified in the state of New Hampshire is 16 weeks. And that's certainly not a lot. And then in Durham, we do eight to 12 weeks further training to indoctrinate the person to the familiarities of Durham, the unions of Durham. And then there's in-service training, which the state requires on an annual basis of 40 hours per year, which is really not much. But what it comes down to is, um, again, it's money. Uh, and then trying to find training uh, or leverage training um, that, um, that will come to Durham at a price that I can afford to make happen is not without challenge. So you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't, in, in Durham, my training budget on an annual basis is 12,500 for 21 police officers. That's not a lot of money. So we have to leverage and work a lot to make that happen. And I can tell you that that 12,500 is significantly more than many police departments in this entire state. But Durham recognizes because of its environment, the, the, the quality of education and what it gives the officers to make better decisions by. So no argument for me. Um, the, the more training, we, we'll, we'll, we'll sop it up. We love that. And it's great to understand how to diffuse situations without um, utilizing force. Uh, quick question, Chief. Sure. Um, police officers, they receive a firearm uh, after 16 weeks? Huh? Yes. OK. <laughs> Actually, they receive a firearm before that, and they have to and again, in Durham, I can only be responsible for Durham. Um, um, they have to qualify with the weapon that they're using, whether it's a firearm, a shotgun, a rifle, pepper ball, handcuffs, whatever the system is, they have to be certified by, to be trained to utilize it when and when. Ted, did you wanna say something? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that there is, um, in many parts of the country, including this part of the country, there is a preference, strong preference in recruiting uh, law enforcement officers that they have bachelor's degree. And the little sidebar to that is they want a range of majors. So a lot of students come up to me and say, well, what do I, what should I major in? And you don't have a, a criminal justice major. And I would argue Massachusetts actually went very heavy on that and ran into a little trouble that it was too narrow a training 
So most of the police departments that I uh, work with want anthropology majors, political science majors, physics majors. They want a range of majors that have really entertained kind of the pressing issues of our time. And then they go into that kind of, uh, you know, more narrow training on what their obligations are, the legal obligations are as a public safety officer. So I think the trend in the United States is clearly moving in a positive direction. But I'm a realist. There are pockets out there that aren't quite with that program. Hello. Hello. OK, there it is. So my question is, in my community, one of my city officials was recently under scrutiny by his statements on effectiveness of criminal law enforcement. My question is, to what extent do you think the legislative debate between citizens slash public officials affect the reformation of the criminal justice system at large? And do you think criminal justice reformation should be approached on the national level, or should there be devolution of this power to the states? And do you think that there will be a benefit to having a uniform law instead of state laws? And to add, to what extent do you think international treaties slash accords should affect criminal justice here in the US? So some questions about scale. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this has actually come up before, this idea of, of I think Dave, you used the word parochial, right? That, that police departments are different depending on what town you're in. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, there is something called the model penal code, which many states adopt kind of whole in the whole cloth and that does sort of make some uniformity between states and state laws it doesn't change however the discretion that's exercised by police and by prosecutors who are you know kind of effectuating those rules so i mean that's been going on since the 50s and actually the the organization that created the model penal code has just come out with a brand new uniform uh, proposal that has to do with the sex crimes laws. So that those those things are kind of happening um, already. Um, other than that, I, I I think you might have better answers. Somebody else on the panel on sort of local versus um, international. <laughs> There's great variation by state and across in cross national comparisons. I would say my response is just as a pragmatist, I think it's a wonderful idea. It will never, ever happen <laughs> in this country. Um, there is a federal jurisdiction and there is state jurisdiction, and those are pretty carefully parsed out. There are cases that blur the lines, but generally speaking, those jurisdictional areas are pretty closely parsed. I will say that, and this gets to Professor Trescoma's uh, observation that, we are the government. So we all cl claim that we, well, the system is this. The system was created by us. So when you mentioned the political process and what goes on in a lot of municipalities, including urban areas, we get the government we deserve. So if you want things changed, then you mobilize to address those issues as social problems that need public policy solutions. And that's the only way that and, and the legal mes, mes, uh, mechanisms that we have to change the law in the way that it operates. Can I clarify? <laughs> I said some of us are the government. Some of us are the government. Yeah. <laughs> Try to be the government. OK. Um, I have a question about the topic we talked right before. Um, I was just thinking, since I grant now, um, the police departments are looking for people of a broad variety of like bachelor degrees. Um, since there's like not a lot of time to like train police officers later on, wouldn't that be a good idea to try to incorporate like a broad training during a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. instead of just like having an 18 weeks training period? I would argue no. I'm going to be really straight and I would argue I think in order to get to that training, you have to do exactly what we're doing now. And it's, a, it's, it's high cognitive functioning that we need in police officers. The training piece, I think, should happen after that. Um, so I would say the same thing is true of the military. If I had my druthers, I think get a college degree two or four years before you enlist. 
Um, I think it's not a good thing to have that infused as Massachusetts tried to do, because what you turn out are factories. And there's no high level cognitive that we don't have discussions like this. It's all about handcuffs 101. I was more thinking about general, like all the broad topics that people are trying to like, get bachelor's degree right into that are looked for. It's like kind of have a fundamental like, way to like, address the most. I see the point. Um, and the great thing about the academy is we can argue. And I would say I understand that, and there may be some benefits to that, but from my perspective, I would argue against that. In fact, that was a, a, a clear decision that the UNH faculty made when it knew that it wanted to offer some, er some uh, coursework in this area. So it chose to call its program the Justice Studies Program. Um, to look into not only criminology, but law and society, big ideas. If we were to offer, you know, criminal procedure, it's not to say those are bad things, but, you know, save that for law school or the training academy. What we want to do, particularly in the liberal arts, is to develop certain qualities of mind that are necessary and only really uh, produced through this kind of discourse that we have here. It, it will get watered down if you try to do the two things at once. That would be my view. Hi. Um, what's that? I'm good? OK. Um, so I want to get back to the big theoretical uh, idea of what is a criminal. And I want to turn it to the after the uh, conviction. And then we call these things corrections. Right, which carries with it a lot of baggage about what we're trying to do, how we define people as criminals, and so on. So I wonder if we can talk about the corrections aspect of it. What are we correcting? How do we go about it? Some of us, uh, so, sorry, some of us, some of you have, have had experience. I've never had experience here. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if maybe we could talk about that aspect of it. What, what does it mean by, by, what do we mean by corrections in the first place? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, corrections. I mean, you know, people think of jail as a form of punishment. It's not. You are there to be, you know, to be corrected, whatever that means. Um, you know, and I think that's different based on whatever jail um, you're looking at. Um, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of where I work. Stratford County is considered one of the most progressive counties in the state. We have a lot of really great programming within our jail. Um, we have an intensive inpatient program built right in. We've got a lot of other um, educational programs, um, vocational services, things like that. Um, as far as my role in the community, though, you know, the mental health court specifically, we were designed as an intervention program. And initially, we started out as um, a pre-adjudication program, so people would would volunteer to participate. And then once they completed the program, they um, didn't have a criminal record due to legislation and politics that we've been talking about, it became a post-adjudication program. So people were required by state legislation to plea in, to take a guilty plea, despite us saying, well, this person acted based on you know, their, their signs and symptoms of their mental illness. Um, the positive to that is a year after their graduation, they can motion the court to annul. But during that process, we're, you know, the, the correction piece is um, getting folks to engage in their own treatment, getting them to take their medications, a lot of the people I see and work with don't have a high school diploma, they don't have a driver's license, they don't have family that is supporting them or a resident. So um, when we talk about what is a criminal and what led someone to the criminal justice system, the correcting that we're doing is just giving them an equal ground to stand on, you know, getting them to a point where they can be as productive as the rest of us, uh, where, you know, whether it be childhood trauma or mental illness or substance use disorders, whatever led them to the point that we're at, we're trying to correct whatever social wrongs and or um, history that they've had. All right. Uh, so this might be a bit of a stretch, but do you think there should be any punishment uh, for crimes? If it's, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but if, if it'd be more beneficial, I guess, in a societal standpoint, to uh, always rehabilitate criminals? Should there be any like, real punishments for crimes? I think that's a really interesting question and, and one that's worth examining because 
politics it comes back to politics and you know two year four year terms make it so that that legislators and politicians don't want to spend the money for a long term gain but if the long term let's say you you are going to take out punishment of the mix i mean just in this magical world take it out and just use treatment and um, you know the programs that you're talking about instead it will cost a lot of money up front but in the long run and you could do data analysis of this in the long run it might lead to increased public safety you know not punishing to the degree that we punish i mean i guess even in a fanciful world we'll still have people that have to be in jail but it's really about a long-term look at you know it might take 10 years to to rehabilitate somebody and money but it's really expensive to keep people just to warehouse people you know i don't know if the, the programs that you just described if you're in jail or are you out on the street uh, the first part that i talked about was in jail but the other part was out yeah. yeah so why not have those programs out on the street right because it costs money on the other hand there clearly are some people who we all should be protected from. So I'm thinking of uh, uh, razor sharp, laser sharp, um, focused, intended, intentional terrorist who plans a course of action and executes this course of action. Right? I'm thinking this person might very well have a life history that led them to. Uh, well, they did have a particular life history that led them to this particular path. But I'm not sure if we should want to, maybe I could be convinced otherwise, I'm not sure that we should want to not want to put such a person away. Um, so the terrorist case is sort of straightforward, but I'm thinking now, what about cases like uh, uh, thieves, you know, like uh, people who uh, execute really, uh, expensive heist on jewelry stores and the like. You know, these are, these are what, what do you call them, lifers, life criminals. You know, they've been planning this, this heist for 30 years, and then they pull it off. Um, clearly, on some account of criminality, they've transgressed. And the remedies, were they to be caught, to put them away. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to deal with such a case. I'm not sure how to deal with such a case, but clearly I think that I want to be protected from an individual or individuals who, um, I want all of us to be protected from individuals who wish to harm us. I would argue too that our entire system of adjudication is premised on this notion of a rational choice so that um, the penalty must always outstrip the pleasure you get from the crime. So you think about it, don't kill. And if you do kill, we might kill you. Oh, as if I'm going to sit there and say, well, I feel like killing, but I might get the electric chair if I don't. So I don't think I'll kill. Or, I, gee, I really like that watch that Professor Perkins is. I think my spouse would like that watch. I think I'll take that watch. But then I might serve some time. So, gee whiz, as much as I want that watch, the penalty outstrip. Now, that assumes that all behavior lends itself to that rational calculus. And to be honest with you, my own view, there's a heck of a lot of crime that's born of expressive or affective uh, origins. And so there is a little bit of a disconnect between the system that we have in place where we set penalties um, based upon what we think that harm is and the value of the good. So there's a difference between me stealing a candy bar or the Rolex watch. Um, and it should give all of us pause about how we got to where we are and whether there are other models that we can think of that would actually be more effective in ensuring our public safety. So I think we'll take one more question and then I want to leave a little time in case people want to speak individually with our panelists. Anybody want to have the last word, last question? Hello, is this working? Um, so my question is about the mental health um, system within prisons and pretty much just what is really provided and how do those inmates 
participate in those services? Do they need a previous diagnosis? Is there a way for them to get help um, if they develop a mental health issue within the system? And if those services are actually taken advantage of or are they neglected? Mayor? Sure, so uh, obviously I can only speak to Stratford County. Um, we uh, do have a medical department that's fully functional uh, that offers uh, both MLADAC and LADAC services. Uh, and we also have a psychiatrist that we, um, that we contract with from the local community mental health center. Um, people are prescribed antipsychotic medications. They're offered counseling. Um, obviously, it's not as good as being on the outside, right? But we do the best that we can. Uh, if someone deteriorates in the jail, they certainly, you know, a correctional officer would probably notice signs and symptoms and, and report that to the medical department. All of our officers are trained to, to, to recognize those types of things. Um, and if it deteriorates to the point where a person needs to be admitted to the state hospital involuntarily, um, in, involuntary emergency admission, uh, we do have a process in place for that as well. Um, so essentially what we do is have them uh, assessed by the psychiatrist, transported to the local hospital for, um, for medical clearance, uh, and then coordinate with the state hospital for their transport there. Um, as I'm sure you all know, New Hampshire is kind of struggling uh, in terms of mental health treatment, as well as psychiatric beds at our state hospital. Um, and so there is unfortunately a wait for folks who are incarcerated, which is, uh, I think there's actually an active lawsuit right now against the state of New Hampshire for not providing uh, enough psychiatric beds. And unfortunately, the folks that are incarcerated do end up getting pushed to the bottom of the list. Um, the people that are in local hospitals are pushed to the top. So um, that's something that we're constantly struggling with. Um, we've tried to um, kind of, I, I've certainly stepped on some toes with um, getting bail orders amended to allow for a person to be released to local hospitals where hospital staff has to be required to sit on them as opposed to correctional staff. Um, I think it's just unethical to have a person incarcerated while they're sick. Um, so we're constantly trying to evolve and work with local agencies and, and, and help people that are, are struggling. Could you describe the therapeutic living? Sure. So um, there's a male unit and a female unit. They have everything from one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling to yoga to uh, voice lessons. To I mean, they have everything that is uh, therapeutic. Um, very holistic approach, surprisingly. Um, but it is in, within the confines of the jail. So um, I think it's a three-month program. The first month, they're not allowed to have any outside contact. They can't contact their family, their friends. They can't write letters, make phone calls. Uh, it's very, very intensive in that first month. Um, and they, it steps down as they go through the program. Um, and most times, if a person is sentenced to the House of Corrections and they're doing that three-month program, there's most likely some suspended time on the end of that. So that kind of incentive to do the program, mm -hmm. and then you'll get out. Um, and the, the counselors there work closely with local agencies to get them housing, um, to get them services, you know, outpatient services already set up for when they're, they're walking out the door. Uh, the jail officer offers them, um, they call it like a survival pack, which is literally a book bag or backpack with soap, fresh clothes, um, bus passes, uh, you know, things like that. So uh, the jail tries to see that continuum of care being a really important um, part of a person's sobriety. So. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to wrap up. And again, I hope you'll come down and speak with our panelists if, uh, if you have further things to say. This is actually a great segue, though, into our next panel, <laughs> which is on um, October 15th. And it's called Paying for Crime, New Hampshire Budget and Policy Priorities and Theory and Practice. This has come up a lot today that it does come down to the politics. It comes down to the money. Um, and uh, so on that panel, actually, we have Chris Brackett, who's the superintendent of the Stratford County Jail, who can talk more about the programs that Blair mentioned. Uh, Helen Hanks, the commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Corrections, and Christopher Keating, who is the director of the Administrative Office of the New Hampshire Courts, which, as I understand it, is the organization that sort of pays for things and <laughs> makes policies. So um, we're hoping to get kind of a, a big picture idea of what we're doing here in New Hampshire to address these political and monetary questions about crime. So I hope that you'll be able to come to that on October 15th. Um, I think that is all we have for today. Thank you so much to our panelists.